to start with the constitutional officer, uh, Auditor Otto, if you're in the room. Welcome to the committee. And I, I know you do this so much, but I'll just repeat <laughs> it anyway. State your name and title for the record. Thank you, Madam Chair. Rebecca Otto, the State Auditor. Um, thank you for allowing me to testify this morning. Um, so legal counsel did point out that there's a brand new provision in this bill that was never heard in any policy committee. This is some of what happened in 2015 as well. And it's not what the founders of our state ever contemplated that we would be passing policy in that way with not understanding what it does or doesn't do. Um, so I want to make a few comments on the level of cuts to a few of the divisions to make sure that the committee understands um, exactly what it's going to mean for the people of Minnesota in oversight of $20 billion per year. The constitutional vision is taking a 21% cut. That and also, by the way, there's a writer on our language that says we cannot make any um, divisional transfers, which has always been part of active management of any state government or office. Um, in terms of your workflow and making sure you get your work done. So that division supports my salary, my overhead, and the boards that I serve on by law. It is underfunded, and so you are not funding the state auditor, which is unconstitutional. The legal aside division is taking 21% and a 21% cut as well. And so that's where we do our special investigations on behalf of the people. That's where local governments are required to report to our office if they found evidence of theft or misuse of public funds by thousands of units of local government. That's also where data requests come out of, which um, Representative Anderson is very familiar with, as she's made many to our office. Um, it's also where we support all the divisions within the office. Everything we do is based in law, so tax increment finance. Um, and the other divisions who need the support, um, we won't be able to do that work because we'll have almost no staff left in that division. We have tiny divisions. We also do training for the League of Minnesota Cities on legal compliance as well as the county's um, issues and updates, making sure that their um, contracting and bidding complies with the laws. Sometimes there's new um, case law that they need to be aware of when carrying out their work. And um, that will be greatly diminished as well. So in terms of being a good government state, we can kiss that goodbye. Government Information Division gets a 21% cut. It's a tiny division, and we have extraordinarily professional staff in all these divisions. Um, they're working with over 1,700 townships, 853 cities, and over 600 special districts, as well as the counties. And they assist them in, um, with their preparing of financial statements, filling out our financial reporting forms, answering all kinds of questions supporting the small city and township accounting system, which is software that our office developed in conjunction with the townships and small cities, which they paid a user fee for, which we train and support on. Um, the ability to do that is gonna be extraordinarily diminished. And we also certify for local government aid in that division. Um, I can tell you what I, I know what it means. And for those of you that have a lot of townships, or small cities, this is gonna have a great impact on their ability to get their work done. It will impact the quality of financial records in the state of Minnesota, and um, we may not be able to fulfill our promise with CTAS, which I know that the Township Association may be concerned about as well, um, because we work in cooperation with them as well as the league. Our OPM division is getting a 21% cut, so that's basically human resources, to make sure we have staff in our divisions and dealing with any other HR issues, technology, finance, and IT. Um, if that goes, then um, I'm not sure how we get our work done because we're pretty much technology-based now. Local governments report through a, 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 a portal, and it's not paper anymore. There's very few that need to work from paper. And so I'm not quite sure, again, how we actually function because we provide all of the financial data, audited financial and reviewed data on local governments for you to use for state agencies to use, for the feds to use, um, and how we will continue to get that done is not possible, even though there's a provision in this bill that says that we are required to divert whatever we're doing to making sure we provide the service. If we don't have the people, we simply cannot provide the service. I also wanna very clearly state that there are provisions in this bill that attempt to interfere in the judicial process, which is clearly unconstitutional. It's my duty and obligation to go to the courts when a law that is passed is unconstitutional. And the 2015 law is currently in the 
Court of Appeals. We expect a decision um, in early June, but there's provisions in this bill that tie my hands in terms of um, any kind of um, appeal going forward, which is interfering in the judicial process, which is part of our constitution. And it also limits my ability to pay legal fees. Um, oh no, it, it requires us to pay the legal fees of those that we are in active litigation, which, which, which is unheard of and unconstitutional. So um, with that being said, I take my oath very seriously. And that's why I sued on the 2015 county audit law. And I am letting you know that you have many unconstitutional provisions in this bill regarding a constitutional office that belongs to the people of Minnesota. And I will carry out my duty as a constitutional officer if I am forced. Even if you're tying my hands in terms of um, further litigation, appeals, but you're doing this in the face and in front of the Court of Appeals who's making a decision. There's three separate branches of government for a reason. We're co-equal, Madam Chair. And I know that you served as a constitutional officer. There's absolutely no reason for these cuts. There's no reasons for these policies. And there's no reason to change a statute on the fly without having held hearings to understand what it means and the implications for the reliability of financial statements of our local governments who issue bonds. The financial markets rely on these financial statements to be fairly stated. We have professionals within our office that make sure that work happens. And if we want to have good government going forward in the state of Minnesota and the financial markets to actually respect what we issue and not have the feds coming in and doing a lot of additional work, um, I ask that you respect this constitutional office and allow us to continue to carry out the work of being the watchdog on behalf of the taxpayers of over $20 billion spent per year. Um, thank you. Thank you, Auditor Otto, for your comments. Uh, the next um, testifier on the list is Commissioner Baden. Pardon? Okay, sorry. Representative Nash, do you have a question? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I did have the auditor, if she's willing to come back up and uh, to the testifier's table. Um, auditor Otto, would you mind uh, coming back for, uh, there you are, to answer the question. Representative Nash. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, to the auditor. Um, regarding the transfer from divisions that you, uh, you object to, can you tell us if you made transfers from any of your divisions um, to the tune of any amount of, of spending to cover your lawsuits? Auditor Otto. Madam Chair, Representative Nash, you've asked me this question about 30 times now in committee. A normal part of management is that you are able to manage the funds that are appropriated to you for the work that you're required to get done. And I'm not sure if you have experience in management, but this is what we do. And this is how government goes. And you have to allow the executive branch to carry out their work and duty. They answer to the people of Minnesota if they haven't done their work adequately. You know that I have used very precious resources from my office. I've been extraordinarily transparent about it to the public and released all of my invoices as they've come forward after they've been redacted for non-public information. I would never have engaged in this lawsuit had there not been an unconstitutional act carried out by the legislature which I testified on in the middle of the night when it happened. Well, Madam Chair. Representative Nash. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm gonna let the, the whether I've managed question go. I, I do run my own company and have quite a few employees, but you know the, the amount that you transferred was $100,000 out of your pension division that uh, you used to pay your lawsuit. And you, know, you ask, why are we doing this? And you make it sound as if we're capricious in doing so. Well, there's a reason that we're doing that so that you don't deprive people who should be getting audits uh, to, or, or to, to use money within your uh, office to pay for a lawsuit. So, you know, I, I just wanted to point out to those that are, uh, that are here or watching that, uh, you know, it was done so for a reason. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Nash, uh, on that theme. Uh, question for you, Madam, Madam Auditor. Chair, can I please respond to something that he just Absol said? Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair, Representative Auditor Nash. Auditor, please. All of our work has been done 
Nobody was deprived of services. You can ask any volunteer fire relief that we have to work with and certify and train and educate to help them be successful with public funds. And they received great service from our office. You can go back. I know that you all have been going into the state accounting system trying to find some sort of a scandal. And we've made transfers over the, I've been in this office 11 years. This is not the first time transfers have occurred. This is a normal part of management. Covering these legal fees has been extraordinarily difficult. But we've gotten our work done. And so it's not a scandal. That's what happens. But if you lock down all of the executive branch to say that no transfers can be made within office in order to carry out our work, that's micromanagement of the executive branch. And that's not appropriate. Representative Nash. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll just let this go. But I uh, just wanted to point out to those at home that it was done with a reason. Um, and it was very deliberate. And uh, I think we're protecting the taxpayers' money. Thank you, Representative Nash. Auditor Otto, mm -hmm. um, generally, uh, or not generally, but as a matter of record, according to state law, the Attorney General is the law office for constitutional officers. And so have you used the Attorney General's office as your attorney to represent you in what you are stating you think is a constitutional issue? Then it would seem that the Attorney General office would be your attorney. Could you respond to that? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Adorado. I actually went to the Attorney General when I was going to file this lawsuit. I have the letter. Um, I know Representative Anderson has it because of her data requests. And I requested from the Attorney General to uh, represent the office in this litigation. I received a letter back, which I've got a copy of as well that I'm happy to provide you, that says that we had to follow the precedent of Matson, And that was Matson v. Kudrowski. And that was that we had to go out and hire our own private firm and use our own funds to pay for this litigation. And that we should make sure that we negotiate a discount on behalf of the taxpayers, which we did. And um, the firm that we that we are working with um, gave us a discount, and they've been um, so that that happened. Um, would I have preferred something different? Sure, but that's. I went to the attorney general. I was not able to get representation. She has her own duty to the people and, you know, is an attorney and knows what she can or cannot do. She did not represent us, so we were required to work with a firm. Thank you. Okay, we'll go to the next testifier on the list, uh, Commissioner Baden. Welcome to the committee. Welcome, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you for taking the time today. For the record, my name is Thomas A. Baden, Jr., Commissioner and State CIO for the State of Minnesota. Um, I'm here because I want to voice the, my concern about the lack of funding for cybersecurity. As I've testified with many of you here before, the threat's real, it's growing, and uh, I believe it's my responsibility as the state CIO to voice my concerns that Minnesota has become a target, the target of criminals that want to take that data and resell it for profit and other uses, as well as hacktivists and a steady stream of attacks on our government. The current levels are, are simply insufficient to deter the threat that's coming at us in, in ever-increasing waves. The bill does recognize and mandate data center consolidation, which is an important piece of the puzzle, a very important piece of the puzzle. Um, however, it's not possible to comply with those objectives without the funding necessary to accomplish that goal. It, uh, it represents about $14 million of the $27 million in the governor's ask, and um, I believe those data centers should be consolidated, but we need the funding to accomplish it. Uh, moreover, the reduction of $3 million in uh, salary savings would directly impact the staff that I need to accomplish those objectives. And so um, I need to utilize those people to do those consolidation. Private industry has recognized that this is an issue and they continue to invest more each year. Many of them have reviewed our plan and the themes are simple and straightforward. We've underinvested in cybersecurity and we need to act urgently. We need to get this work done. We're all responsible for protecting the data of, of all Minnesotans and I ask that you reconsider the funding request in the governor's request in the minute proposal. And thank you for your time today, Madam Chair and members. Thank you, Commissioner. Chair Anderson, and I will call on you also, Senator Lane. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioner Baden. You have uh, heard this from me before, but my biggest concern is, is you have a host of agencies that haven't even come to the table to talk about consolidation and getting ourselves in the same uh, playing field. They extend the list of the Department of Commerce, Department of Education, Department of Health, PARA, DNR, Higher Education, uh, Purpose Center, you've got um, Public Safety, Department of <laughs> Revenue. I understand the Department of Revenue even went as far as spending more money uh, out of their IT for about $400,000 uh, for something that should have gone through minutes. So I think um, we need to take care of that piece. The law was passed in 2011. It still is not being uh, uh, adhere adhered to from the 2011 legislative cycle. And so I think that those are some of the things that we're looking for to see achieved before we go further. So thank you. Thank you, Chair Anderson. Uh, Senator Lane. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Commissioner, were you, uh, were you involved in the in the Minshew process when we were going through that, in, in the collect in the correction of uh, doing the data data work or the technology around Minshew or not? Commissioner I was the Baden, uh, Senator Lane, just check to be sure your microphone is on and also to, to really speak into it very closely. It really makes a difference when you're close. Thank All you. right. Thank you so well, much. It was on, but it didn't sound like it was on. Okay. Yeah. Go, I just have to go close in. We want to hear your comments. Commissioner Baden. I, Madam Chair. Commissioner. First, could I respond to... I keep wanting to call you Chair Anderson, but Representative Anderson. And uh, then could I have her restate the question? I couldn't quite hear it. Okay, so Senator Lane, it's important to speak into the microphone so they can hear your question. Okay, I was, um, I was just, it doesn't sound right. <laughs> it is a bit um, short, it is a bit short. Um, I was just wondering, uh, I was just thinking as the question was asked about since 2011, and I was just thinking, if you were involved in some of the uh, uh, work to do to try to bring the Minshew process up to date as far as technology goes, I was just trying to, just off the cuff, I was just wondering that, and then I would um, like to make some other comments about your task, but I was just wondering if that was the job of technology is an extensive and deep job, and it takes time to do, so I'm just wondering about your comments. Commissioner Baden. Madam Chair, um, in response, I was I was active in that I was the Chief Information Officer at Department of Human Services at the time, and Human Services, of course, had a had a big large component in that. My central focus was the underpinning infrastructure of that system, which included uh, the network pieces, the uh, the Oracle Exadata boxes, the middle tier components, you know, the infrastructure piece of it, not as much the actual development of the solution itself. Thank you, so, Commissioner Baden. Senator Ma Lane. Madam Chair, um, so that wasn't under minute. That was just the thought that came to me. That wasn't under minute. It was. It was actually Baden. run by Min Madam Chair, and and Senator Lane. Um, it was actually the Minshew organization that ran the IT project. Okay. Thank Madam you, Chair. Commissioner Baden. Senator Lane. Madam Chair, I would just like to uh, echo the uh, the the awareness that um, what I call the new mafia. The new mafia is the organized networks of cyber criminals. They're extremely well funded. Um, they hold systems hostage. They steal the data and they sell the data. That to me represents our, our, our current day mafia. And this is huge and it's attacking everywhere all the time where there's gonna be value to their um, bottom line and uh, state governments is one of those. And we need to get up to par on this or we will be regretful of it. Thank you, Senator Lane. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Baden. Um, okay, next, um, any other questions from members? Okay, thank you, Commissioner Ma Baden. Madam Chair, could I just Commissioner make one Baden? comment? Yes. Um, when, when Minute came together, it was essentially an unfunded mandate. And as, uh, as I came into the, the program here a little over two years ago, we had made a lot of progress that met the intent of the law However, a lot of the components, including the data center consolidation pieces, needed to be executed. And I actually concur with, with the law in that those data center consolidations need to happen. But as Minute was unfunded, we were doing it as we could, you know, doing it evenings, weekends, work. I would, I, I would, I would like to accelerate that process and actually execute upon consolidating those six data centers. Thank you, Commissioner Baden. With that, we'll move on to the next testifier. Madam Chair and members, thank you. Thank you. We'll take uh, Commissioner Mossman. Mm -hmm. 
Welcome, Commissioner. Good to uh, see Madam you again. Chair and members, uh, Matt Mossman, Commissioner of Administration. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify this afternoon. Morning, afternoon. Um, as I've previously testified, members, uh, Senate File 605 contains significant damaging and arbitrary cuts to the Department of Administration, a budget that is already smaller today than it was in 2008 in nominal dollars. There's no inflation assumed uh, into state agency budgets. Senate File 605 to pro proposes that the department continue to perform all of its current functions and actually assigns additional responsibilities to the department while appropriating 24% less funding than what is needed to continue operations in 2018 and 2019. If Senate File 605 uh, were to be enacted, this legislation would cause the elimination of fully one third of the department's uh, general fund staff uh, and workforce. Such drastic cuts uh, would be unwarranted given a $1.65 billion surplus and will reduce government efficiency and increase the cost of government rather than to reduce the cost of government. I think we all agree that Minnesotans expect state agencies to spend taxpayers' money efficiently to deliver customer service that meets Minnesotans' expectations and uh, to continuously look for innovative and smarter ways to perform our work. Among some of the ways that the Department of Staff or that the Department staff do that today that would be impacted by these cuts are that in just the last two years alone, our procurement contract staff have saved taxpayers $30 million through lower negotiated contract prices. Information I have from one of our uh, leasing specialists in our real estate and construction services area. Uh, is that he negotiated $713,000 in contract uh, space savings in 2015 and a little over one point and a little over $1 million in uh, lease savings in 2016. Yet another leasing specialist was able to uh, find uh, savings from what was uh, uh, proposed by a landlord of a million dollars in just one lease alone. It is unrealistic, uh, members, to believe that these uh, positions and the work of the agency in these areas can continue uh, if these budget cuts are maintained. Equally baffling is the proposed elimination of the SMART program and the prohibition on spending funds on lean and continuous improvement. It's simply unrealistic uh, to believe that the department can uh, meet its statutory expectations uh, in if we're not funded at the governor's recommended funding level. Um, Madam Chair and members, uh, most importantly, uh, I wanna talk about the items that the governor has recommended and the importance of those. The governor has been clear that he does not support uh, these agency budget cuts. More importantly, the governor's budget recommendations continue the state's sound fiscal management and the efficiency of state government uh, in a, an appropriate fashion. Uh, several of the recommendations in particular, Madam Chair, that I want to highlight are that Governor Dayton's uh, recommendations for uh, e-procurement, base budget adjustments, and the census are essential to modernizing uh, the state's information technology systems to addressing critical cybersecurity issues, ensuring contract compliance, and maximizing Minnesota's 2020 census count. Let me just spend a little bit of time on the last one. Uh, I, I guess have assumed that all of us here, bipartisanly, and those uh, across the state of Minnesota believe that it is wise to maximize uh, the state's uh, 2020 census count for any number of reasons. One, uh, to maintain and put position the state as best possible uh, to maintain its congressional representation at the current level, and two, to be positioned for federal resources as best we can for the next decade. Uh, fully uh, billions of dollars in federal funds are uh, distributed uh, every decade uh, on these uh, counts alone, and we estimate that $1,400 per person per year uh, is the impact of each person that we fail to count uh, in the 2020 census here in Minnesota. So, Madam Chair and members, I urge you to reconsider uh, the reductions to the Department of Administration that you have in this budget, and I would particularly um, want to call out the reductions that you have the one-time 
funds that are taken from the uh, facilities repair and renovation account, which you increased uh, the cut that was proposed in the House to a larger dollar amount. Obviously, those dollars, and we can bring you a list, uh, we have planned projects for those dollars, um, which uh, would result in them not um, being uh, implemented. So I urge you to uh, unwind the cuts and to fund the governor's recommendations going forward. I'm happy to stand for any questions. Thank you, Commissioner Mossman. Uh, members' questions? Chair Anderson? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Commissioner Mossman, in the 2015 and 2016 uh, legislative cycles, you were designated as the point person by the governor to uh, be part of the negotiations with us. You were the person that was the voice for the governor. So I'm just asking, are, are you going to be the voice again for the governor as his uh, chief negotiator when it comes to the state government finance? Uh, area. Madam Chair and committee members, I think as I Austin. and my fellow commissioners have uh, previously responded to this question before, um, we all have expertise in our budget areas and we fully intend along with um, other uh, legislative members uh, to work directly with all of you uh, to come to a resolution on budgets that work for the agencies within the state government division. Chair Anderson. I thank you, Madam Chair. and. Uh, Commissioner Mossman, does that mean that each of the commissioners are negotiating on behalf of the governor? So what you say is truly the wishes of the governor. Commissioner Mossman. Well, Madam Chair and members, I think the process is uh, really no different than it's ever been, which is that conference committees um, work with the uh, commissioners in the jurisdiction and will come to a resolution. Obviously, um, both legislative leadership and uh, ultimately we will present uh, recommendations that the committee comes to and that we arrive at to the governor for his approval and consideration. Chair Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Commissioner Mossman, at what point can we expect the governor to engage in the negotiation process? Madam Chair and members, uh, I, the governor is engaged, has been engaged all throughout the legislative session and will continue to do so. Chair Anderson? I'll leave it. Thank you, Madam All Chair. right. Um, I just wanted to ask you, Commissioner Mossman, you mentioned uh, savings. So on those savings, were those returned then at the end of the year uh, to the general fund? Because if they're savings, they should go back to the general fund. Uh, Madam Chair, I, I really appreciate the question because it, it gives an opportunity for, I think, all of us to help understand the way uh, the state budget works. There's no inflation built into the forecast. This, these, the, the, the job responsibilities of the people who do that work at the Department of Administration and my agency, that is the expectation. So, in effect, it's built into the forecast. There is an assumption built into the state budget that there is centralized expertise at agencies like the Department of Administration who are making the state run and assist in other state agencies to run as efficiently as possible. So those expectations are already built into uh, the biennial budget uh, forecast and expectations. And what I'm suggesting to you is that there is, uh, it's simply not realistic that we can continue to perform that work in the absence of having the resources to do so. Thank you, Commissioner Mossman, but I will state here then, there was no savings to the general fund. You changed the how you spent the money and decided on your own uh, to change how it was spent. Well, so that's Madam Chair, how I if, see if it. I could, that, Mossman, that's actually... Please wait to be recognized. And so, um, to me, savings is uh, returning the money to the general fund, then it is a savings to our taxpayers. If you've changed how you've spent it, uh, that's a different matter. Commissioner Mossman. Madam Chair, and thank you. I apologize for, for interjecting. Um, I'm happy to call it cost avoidance as opposed to savings. It's either way you, wanna, you want to look at it. Specifically, what happens is um, we uh, have an RFP process or we have a bid process and we select winning vendors. And because our contract experts have an understanding of the markets and the products and goods and services that we're purchasing, we will, after we've selected a winning contractor, um, will oftentimes go to look at those prices and say, no, we actually believe that we should be able to get a lower price uh, than what was submitted in the winning contract and we can document those. So if, if we prefer to call them cost avoidance, it's fine. And the point is we will not have the staff expertise to negotiate those. Thank you, Commissioner Mossman, for your comments. <clears throat> Members, any questions? Uh, seeing none, thank you for your testimony. 
<clears throat> I skipped over somebody here. Uh, Mr. Seigel? And Commissioner Franz, you'll be next if that helps uh, folks to kind of have an idea of they're going to be next. Mr. Seigel, welcome to the committee and state your name and your who you represent for the record. Thank you, Madam Chair. And you will have two minutes, Mr. Seigel. Thank you. So my name is Dave Siegel. I'm the Executive Director for the Builders Association of the Twin Cities. And I'm here today in support of the housing regulation rulemaking provision included in this bill. In that How case, maybe we could give you another two minutes. <laughs> I've been purposefully brief. <laughs> The housing industry supports this provision which allows the legislature to exercise its proper role of regulatory oversight if it so chooses. It's important to note that this is not an effort to diminish the resource protections and safety elements that are advanced by the various regulations affecting the housing industry. We agree with the majority of these regulations and we have great respect for the professionals and the various state agencies who manage them. However, We've reached a point where the accumulation of rules, regulations, and fees across multiple agencies is creating a staggering cost impact for Minnesota's families and our housing market. This is illustrated by the fact that a decade ago, 70% of the houses we built in our market were less than $350,000, and today, just 30% of the new homes that we build are less than $350,000. I might point to a recent article in the St. Paul Pioneer <laughs> Press, which asks the all important question, what's driving up the cost of new homes? And the reporters answer this question. Homes in Minnesota cost far more than they do across the country due to the high cost of regulations. In fact, in one case outlined in the article, same home built in 2015 cost $15,000 more than it did in 2014, one year difference due to code requirements. We have achieved safety and durability, but the affordability piece is often overlooked. And we believe this provision will bring that element into the rulemaking process, which will result in better policy for all Minnesotans. Thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity to join the conference committee today. Thank you, Mr. Siegel. Members, any questions? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Uh, Commissioner Franz? <coughs> Welcome to the committee, Commissioner. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. <clears throat> Appreciate the opportunity to testify today. What I'd like to do briefly, Madam Chair and members, is um, talk a little bit about the, uh, my overall reaction and perspective on the uh, conference report that you've issued today. I at first didn't know, really know where to start when I was looking at the, uh, at the report, and um, so I thought I really would start at the beginning. And the beginning really was last summer. It was last summer that the governor, and uh, under his direction, that I began working on the budget with MMB and all of the agencies. It's that process that we're really talking about today. So in the summer and last fall, MMB and all the agencies worked together and also with all the boards and commissions to understand what they've been doing in terms of their the resources that they've used, the concerns that they had. We also studied what does it cost each biennium for each agency to operate. So one of the things I think I want to make it clear is that when we uh, prepare a budget or base budget, if there's no change to that base budget going forward for the next two years, it will cause the agencies uh, cuts because they'll have to, there'll be inflation that won't be accounted for, there'll be salary growth that won't be accounted for, there'll be health insurance costs that won't be accounted for, leasing costs, legal costs. So what we did in this process last summer and last fall was put together a detailed agency by agency, commission by commission, process of, uh, of understanding and projecting what those operating adjustments would be for the next two years, maintaining current service level. And that's what we did. And so in, in the agency request that you've looked at and we've talked about many times, you've looked that process over and we've tried to make it clear that it's these things that if we maintain current service level, we're going to need to have these costs associated, these increased costs 
or budget revenues in order to uh, provide the same level of service. But it was really during that process, and, and the statute requires, by the way, the statute requires that MMB present the budget under the direction of the governor. And let me be really clear about the supervision and direction of the governor. Uh, from the very beginning in the summer and the fall and throughout the, the winter and the preparation of the delivery of the budget on January 24th, when the governor and I went before the uh, press and presented the budget, he's been extremely involved over every budget area, every, budget area, every, every particular budget request, actively involved, actively preparing and presenting what he believed was the, the, the budget that he felt was required. That budget, that 3,000-page budget that we presented on January 24th is our recommendation to you all that this is what we believe we should do going forward to fund agencies and maintain the service level that we believe the Minnesotans want. Obviously, we have disagreements over, over some of those issues, but I think the key important ingredient is that process presented you with a lot of information. And we've, we've been spending the last several months talking about that. I just think it's important to remember that, that there's been over 538 testimonies by agencies over the last several months to the legislature, as it should be. There have been over 1,100 meetings between agencies and, and legislators, as it should be. And I think we, you know, we've provided letters and in fact, I, I would like the, the, the uh, pages to hand out the two letters that, I've, that I wrote to Chair Anderson and to Chair Kiffmeyer back in April and March that really haven't changed much because unfortunately the, the, um, the conference report hasn't changed much. But I think what's clear, <clears throat> I think what's clear is that in this dialogue that we've had over the last several months, that, that we've been engaged extensively. We've had conversations, and I've met with, I think, everyone individually, although Representative Detmeyer has uh, avoided my, uh, my grasp lately, but we, we're not going to give up yet. We'll still get that meeting scheduled. But I think the key is negotiation, discussion, uh, debate about what we all think is the right thing. We all clearly want what's best for Minnesota and what's best for the state to go forward. And that's why it's particularly concerning to me that MMB is cut anywhere from 22 to 24 percent over the next several years. And I, I just want to say that MMB has been at the forefront since I uh, came in to, to work for the governor in 2011 when we faced a $6 billion deficit. We all worked on that, all of us who were here worked on that very diligently, very concerned about that. And we've been able now since that time to see four or uh, four years now of positive budget balances. We've been able to see a AAA rating restored to the state of Minnesota. MMB has been at the forefront of working on these issues with the legislature, and I just want to reiterate that a 23, 24% cut to MMB simply will mean MMB will not be what it is today. I simply cannot imagine how that agency would operate with about 25% less people involved. So, you know, the letter is there. We've gone through these issues before. I'm not going to go through the letter and, and issue, uh, talk about all the concerns about MMB specifically. What I wanted to do today, though, was talk about the engagement, the process, the information. And unfortunately, we feel that the report that's been issued today doesn't take into account the concerns raised by the governor. In fact, I think it, it goes the wrong way. And I think one of the things that we have a concern about is that is that without a recognition of where we need to end up, it's going to be a very difficult process to, neg to navigate. And one of, the, one of the issues that we've talked about has been the concern about growth in government. Well, you know, one of the things that I've learned in the 30 years that I was practicing law and the several years that I was running a company and now the six years that I've been running MMB and then uh, uh, revenue before that, one of the things I've learned is when I get advice from folks, I often look to see if they're following the same advice that they're giving me. And in this particular case, I don't see the legislature following the same advice that they're giving the governor. For example, I do not see any cuts in the legislative budget. The legislative budget has grown 23 percent since 2011, and there is no budget cuts anywhere in this budget proposal. The legislative carry forward has grown 55 percent to $16 million now. The carry forward is a tool that the legislature has that the executive office doesn't really have with some limited exceptions. So what I'm concerned about is if, if, you know, if you believe that we should be cutting services, 
cutting what we do, then I would certainly think you would be doing the same thing. One of the concerns that we have is that there are a lot of ideas in here about how to manage state government, that uh, your suggestions about how to uh, cap employees or cap compensation. Well, I don't see any cap on hiring or compensation in the legislature. I don't think that's a good way to run. I'm not suggesting you should do it, frankly, because I don't think that's the way you run a business or you run a government. And I know government is different than business in some cases, but no one, I don't think, would, would engage in that kind of management. So just to mention a few things, I believe that if we're going to go forward and work in a dialogue where we agree to talk about issues that we can both engage in, both the legislature and the governor, I don't see much hope for this particular, this particular report gaining much traction with the governor. In fact, I will obviously be recommending to the governor that we have to have more discussions about this area as we go forward. So with that, I'm happy to take questions, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Franz. Thank you, Commissioner Franz. Members, questions? Chair Anderson? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, Commissioner Franz, appreciate you coming here today. Um, what I think we're really looking for is actually getting the governor to engage in the negotiation process, engaging with the legislative leaders to set joint targets. That's what we're looking for. That hasn't happened at all. He hasn't been engaged in that process. Instead, he's kind of has been um, outside of that and kind of watching what the legislature has done. So I, I'm hopeful that he will get to that point and will be part of this process so that we can get the work of Minnesotans done. But I also wanted to comment on the fact of your comments that you have made regarding your budget. And under the governor's proposal, your budget would increase by 78%. You would go from 47.7 million to about 84 million. And I don't think there's anybody in the state of Minnesota is expecting that their budget is going to increase by 78%. They certainly don't think that about state government, that the state government would increase by 78%. So we're just here to try and rein things in and make sure that we are protecting the taxpayers in Minnesota. But again, I appreciate you coming here today. Thank you, Chair Anderson. Commissioner? Uh, Madam Chair, uh, uh, com uh, Chair Anderson. Well, I certainly uh, don't understand your comments about the governor because they simply don't, re re they're not based in reality. And so I think it's clear uh, that, you know, we don't have the uh, speaker and the majority leader sitting here negotiating with us right now. So I'm assuming they're not involved in the process. Of course, I don't assume that. The key is we in we're, we're involved in this process. The governor is actively involved. We're here on his behalf to make that engagement. The other thing about this increase, one of the reasons we're asking for an increase is for the state uh, statewide system uh, financial uh, system, and so I'm glad you raised that. You raised that concern about increase. As the, as the chief financial officer for the state of Minnesota, I can tell you without question that the system that we're currently using needs to be upgraded now. In January 1, 2018, it will no longer be serviced by the company that provides that particular service. It will cost us more money contract money to solve any particular problems that we may have, and we probably will have them. So the, the, one of the big increases in MMB is specifically for the enterprise, for the enterprise to have a functioning, up-to-date accounting system that, is, that a state this size absolutely needs. Uh, Commissioner Franz, when was the SWIFT system initially built? When did it go live? Madam Chair, it went live in 2011. 2011 it was a very expensive system, and it's lasted us uh, six years, maybe seven or eight. It was a very, very expensive system, and it lasts only that long. I'm very disappointed in that. So, uh, members, any other questions? Commissioner. Madam Hans. Chair, I, I once again have to correct the record that we have spent very little money in maintaining and upgrading that system. It's like anything that you buy. If you buy something five or six years ago and you don't upgrade it and keep it into compliance, you're going to lose the, the, the ability of that system to be up to date and providing all the uh, uh, functions that it can. So we have neglected to maintain on an annual basis that particular system. That's why we're asking for so much money now. The longer we wait, the more it's going to cost to fix it. So with, with all due respect, Madam Chair, I think we've neglected to keep that system up to date. Well, Commissioner, having experience with this, regular maintenance is normal. And updates and maintenance and all those things are quite normal. We have another question. Representative Nash. Thank you, Madam Chair. Commissioner, 
You just talked earlier in your opening remarks about 1,100 meetings that you've had with various legislators since the beginning of the session. And I just want to make sure that was the right number. Madam Chair, Commissioner Franz. Representative, the, the agencies in total have had over 1,100 meetings. Well, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Nash. Thank you, Madam Chair. Commissioner, you know, I, I have had a couple of requests into you for meetings uh, and for information for months regarding the gain train program. I've had detailed questions of you on that. I have talked to you at multiple venues, multiple times. I've talked to members of your staff, and I have asked for detailed information. Haven't gotten it until about 11 minutes before our meeting here today. I got a very broad, glossed over letter and a very lack of detailed um, spreadsheet. It wasn't even a spreadsheet. It was just a, a, a Word document of the gain sharing issue. Commissioner, I have asked you again and again and again, so please don't think, folks, that, that, that you've fully engaged because I have asked you multiple times, multiple places, in committee, out of committee. When we were out of the Three Rivers Park, we talked about that very same thing. And yet, Commissioner, you've given me no details. And the details that you did give us earlier on were redacted, which I think is not exactly the best way to roll things out. So, Commissioner, I, I guess I'm just surprised that you can sit here today and tell us that you feel like you've engaged in the process when clearly the information that you give me is scant at best. Thank you, Madam Chair. Commissioner. Madam Chair, Representative, well, I appreciate your concerns. You know, it, uh, once again, I think the record needs to be clear. It was, it was in July of 2015 that I wrote this committee about what we were doing with gain sharing and achievement awards. I wrote a detailed letter and report outlining the concerns and the issues and the difficulties involved in that process. I heard nothing since July of 2015 until maybe December when Madam uh, Chair Anderson sent me a letter. So. You know, th this process of sharing information is a two-way street. We gave you information. We didn't hear anything for a year and a half, and we will, we will continue to respond. As you mentioned, I responded today. and We'll continue to provide information as you requested. Representative Nash. Madam Chair and Commissioner, um, you talk about detailed information, and I can have the page pass us around if you like, but this is what you gave us. This is what you gave me today. It's very, very scant, as I said before. It, it doesn't tell us anything. Uh, in fact, I think it covers up more than it, it actually reveals. So, Commissioner, I, again, I've, I've talked to you a number of times about what we've talked about since you came to committee regarding this, since the cuts that we put in this budget, um, and I, I just feel like I've been slow played. So, thank you. Thank you, Representative Nash. Thank you, Commissioner members. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you very much, Commissioner. I will go to the next testifier, Ms. Fatay. And then we'll have Mr. Vekic will be next. Hello, welcome Ms. Fatay. And for the, for the audio record, state your name and who you represent. Thank you, Chair, members of the committee. My name is Laylee Fadahi, and I represent Friends of the Mississippi River. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the committee for not including the repeal of the Legislative Water Commission in this bill. But we are very disappointed to see the inclusion of the Minnesota Chamber's rulemaking provisions from the House version uh, included in Article 4. These are the most profound and far-reaching changes to administrative procedure and law that we've seen probably in decades, which makes it especially concerning that they were only introduced and heard in one chamber of the legislature, that they were never given a hearing before a judiciary committee, and they were never assigned any fiscal notes despite the fact that they necessarily and explicitly will impose considerable cost on all state agencies. These provisions impose massive, time-consuming, expensive, and totally unnecessary hurdles that uh, all agency must go through, not only to adopt a rule, but even to propose a rule. And that makes it so that even after going through all of those hurdles, a rule still has to be enacted by law. Um, 
you know, so the bill makes it so that a single legislative committee can block an agency, not just from adopting, but even from proposing a rule. It creates a mechanism for virtually any proposed rule to undergo a five-person peer review panel uh, that has to determine the scientific, technical, and economic basis for the rule, but for which there are no requirements for expertise. Um, it provides that a proposed rule, even after it goes through that, can't even take effect until after it's been enacted by the legislature. It gives regulated entities an affirmative defense to comply with any regulation that costs more than $50,000. Oh, and it makes it also so that the agency has to pay for all of this out of its operating budget and then also creates a pre legal presumption against an agency whenever it doesn't go through this process. Not once has anyone testified as to any justification for any of these provisions. Not once has anyone testified, not al you know, let alone demonstrated, as to how any of these provisions actually save money or speed up regulatory decisions. And I think that that's for good reason, because it would be impossible to do so. In fact, I'd go one step further and say that the effect intended or unintended of these provisions is to legally, operationally, and especially financially overwhelm agencies so that they can't carry out their regulatory mandates. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Vitae. Uh, Mr. Vekic? Uh, well, first, I'm sorry, members, any questions? Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Vekic? Or, I don't know if you look like Mr. Vekic here. Yeah, but state you, your Chair. name and uh, who you represent for the audio record. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. Uh, for the record, I'm Chris Kwapik, uh, legislative liaison for the Minnesota Lottery. Mr. Vekic uh, unfortunately had a family emergency and had to, uh, had to leave, so hopefully I can fill in for him. Um, first of all, let me say thank you to uh, Chairs Anderson and Kiff Meyer for uh, including our uh, operations budget in both bills um, at its recommended base level. Uh, this will allow the lottery to continue uh, its work to provide new and entertaining games to its players and to provide the state of Minnesota and its beneficiaries with a consistent form of revenue. The lottery is proud to have, have had six consecutive years of sales over $500 million and is on pace to continue that trend in this fiscal year. Since inception, the lottery has contributed over $2.6 billion back to the state and is on pace to add another $130 plus million to that total this year. Um, we do, however, have uh, concerns with section 28 of the DE amendment beginning on page 43. Uh, the section repeals the lottery's exemption from consolidation into minutes. Our concerns are the same as they were in 2011 when minute was created um, when the lottery and when the lottery was exempted in the first place. Namely, that if the lottery is consolidated into minute, the lottery could likely be forced to stop selling its multi-state games like Powerball and Mega Millions. The Minnesota Lottery currently conducts four multi-state games, Powerball, Mega Millions, Hot Lotto, and Lucky for Life, under agreements with the Multi-State Lottery Association, also known as Muscle. Muscle is owned and operated by its member lotteries, and multi-state games are administered nationwide to 47 different lotteries, all of which are subject to the same requirements and standards for security and integrity. These measures are in place to protect each lottery from the risk of potential fraud and negligence from any other participating lottery. Uh, in both 2011 and just this past month, Muscle has informed the Minnesota Lottery that uh, IT consolidation uh, efforts uh, could likely violate Muscle standards for security and integrity. Specifically, the lottery cannot transfer control of technology procurement or current coordination of information technology from secure lottery operations to parties outside the direct control of the lottery and still comply with those muscle rules. The sales of multi the sales of multi-state games in FY16 amounted to $134 million, or approximately 22.68% of our sales, uh, annual sales, and bring in over $50 million in revenue for the state of Minnesota each year. In the brief amounts of time that we've had uh, to understand the amendments that was added to uh, the, DE, uh, the DE language on line 44.12, uh, the lottery still has uh, concerns about what the certification by the state CIO means for our agency. Um, uh, the lottery is in a unique position of acting like a, a business owned by the state of Minnesota, and we are not sure what this means, not only in terms of uh, IT consolidation, but also co the cost of consolidation. Uh, we have a fiduciary responsibility to run as efficient of an agency as possible in order to maximize 
uh, returns to the state beneficiaries. Uh, we also have a responsibility for security and integrity of our games. Security is so much of an area of importance that the lottery has hired a new uh, chief information security officer to oversee, maintain, and upgrade the systems, security sy surrounding our gaming systems. Um, and also the lottery currently has many successful partnerships with Minutes and will continue to uh, leverage Minutes expertise when it can. Um, therefore, Madam Chair, uh, for these reasons, uh, we respectfully ask that you reconsider uh, Section 28 from the DE amendment. Um, we ask that you take into account the original reasons for exemption and not put at risk the ability to sell some of our most uh, popular games. Uh, thank you for your time and, uh, and, your, and for hearing our concerns. Thank you very much. Uh, members, any questions? Uh, Chair Anderson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Mr. Kwapik, for your comments. Um, we did meet with you and sat down and uh, looked through your concerns, and the language that we put on page 44.12 through 44.16 was to address those concerns. So as long as uh, Minute can accommodate all of the things that you have stated here today, then you would be part of the consolidation. We've looked at other states too that are part of the lottery system that have gone through their own consolidation. They're still part of the lottery. They're still selling tickets in their state. And so if we can do the same thing here, that's what our goal is going to be. So thank you for your comments. Right. Uh, Mr. Kwapik. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair and, and uh, Chair Anderson. And uh, um, we appreciate the work that's gone into it. Again, we haven't had the time to um, fully vet what that all means, but we, um, uh, we do appreciate that that has gone into that, that we do have a chance to take a look at, but we wanted to make sure that um, our concerns were just voiced on the record. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Members, any other questions? Uh, Senator Lane. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm just concerned if, if we are asking Minute to uh, finish the job we've given them in the past to continue to uh, consolidate 26, I think, more entities down to, to a total of six. Um, and they're saying that I don't even have the um, uh, staffing or money to, to do that. Why would we be adding, in a rhetorical question, why would we be adding more to their plate before they finished what they have? And I also have um, um, become a little concerned as to, because that doesn't make sense to me. So then I, sometimes when something doesn't make sense, you look further into it, and I've become aware that um, the, we are, uh, we are, we are um, working with a private vendor for some of the data storage, and it's a wonderful data storage place with uh, great redundancies and safety. However, um, there has been an, a lobbyist involved on their part to seek more business for them which means uh, bring more people in, bring more people in so that we can have more data storage. Um, I do not want state government to be, as it so often is, but do, don't want it to be led by um, outside vendors. We need to do our work and it's what's appropriate here. So I come back to the statement that I believe that Minute has a lot on its plate right now um, until that is done and more resources, that we shouldn't be adding more uh, areas for them to consolidate. So that's my concern. Thank you, Senator Lane. Members, any other? Okay. Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Okay, um, I will take Commissioner Bowerly next. Thank you, Commissioner. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair. And for the record, my name is Cynthia Bowerly. I'm the Commissioner at Minnesota Revenue. Thank you for the opportunity to share my concerns with the conference amendment. Um, but first, I want to take a moment to um, thank particularly staff. I did observe that the timestamp on the spreadsheet was 1.40 a.m. So um, it's clear that a great deal of volume of work was put into these documents, and we appreciate your service. Um, however, with, the con with respect to the content of the bill, um, I do have to express my concerns. This bill as drafted represents about $32 million less in funding than is needed for the Department of Revenue to continue our current level of services. It fails to fund the Governor and Lieutenant Governor's recommendation for our operating adjustment for the Department's work of $20 million, and it fails to fund even our base budget, cutting it by $12 million. 
<laughs> Shall I continue, Madam Chair? The, well, the yes, I'm on? just, I think you should just go right ahead. Okay. <laughs> we'll see what happens, but okay. just, just plow right on. Failing to fund the governor's request for operating adjustments for the department would mean that we would lose approximately 120 employees. Just a of moment. The just a moment. Madam Chair, I, I just I want to make sure that the tape is still working. Is it? it, is it? Okay. okay, we've right. confirmed the tape is still working. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank so you, sorry Madam to Chair. interrupt. A little bit of excitement here. <laughs> well, we always have a lot of excitement at the Department of Revenue, so here <laughs> we go. And you brought the. All right. Um, so the department's uh, budget it largely funds sta staff. So our staff work with Minnesotans every day and help them understand what their obligations are under Minnesota's tax laws. They answer questions over phone, over email. We provide classes to small businesses as they're getting started so that they can understand their obligations under Minnesota tax law. And of course, we process returns and issue refunds. Losing uh, this level of funding will mean that we will be, uh, need to reduce our staff by about 20 million, by about, sorry, 200 people um, over the course of the next two years. And this bill also ignores the additional investments that the governor proposed to meet new demands from our customers, such as emerging patterns of fraud and the growing number of customer requests for guidance on complex tax questions. In addition to the troubling significant reduction in the amount of resources needed to maintain our existing services, the bill language requires us to do exactly that. The writer in section 14 of the bill specifically states that we can spend no less on tax compliance activities than we did in fiscal 17. These activities would include audit, enforcement, collection, appeal, legal support and audit, data analytics to find those furthest from compliance, education, information, and outreach to help those voluntarily comply and support for those filing systems. The rider in section 14 goes on to state that we must prioritize refund processing and uh, fraud prevention. In addition, section 39 of the bill states that the reductions must not be made to services provided directly to members of the public. For the department, these services include education, information, and outreach, help for customers as they walk into our uh, St. Paul location, call in or email the department, the ability to provide property tax education guidance and assistance to county auditors, the timely processing of refunds, and the protection of taxpayer information from fraud. So between the rider in section 14 and the policy statements in section 39, the bill describes essentially all of our work at the Department of Revenue. And yet you would have us perform all of our current services with the cuts proposed in the bill. We simply cannot absorb the appropriation reduction and meet the requirements of this bill or the services that we would want to provide to Minnesotans. <coughs> and accordingly, the combination of this reduced funding level and the riders will limit our ability to effectively and efficiently administer taxes and could have a negative impact on the revenue stream. The base reductions proposed by the bill alone could result in an estimated loss of about 30 million in general fund revenues. We have some concerns with a couple of specific provisions. Um, we appreciate the acknowledgement for the first time home buyer credit that new tax policy decisions made in the tax committee have an impact on the department's budget. In addition to this item, there are many other provisions in the House Senate Conference Committee amendment bill that will have significant costs to the department to administer. We have provided the tax chair as a full description of the administrative costs for that bill. We are concerned uh, with the language about adding federal taxes to incident reports changes as I, cha as I shared with you last week. We think that uh, including this uh, information uh, will not serve uh, to educate law lawmakers as you make policy choices. Instead, it will just confuse the issue because these taxes at the federal level are not uh, included in your jurisdiction. Um, with respect to the pipeline valuation report, the department has shared with uh, Chair Anderson a, a few weeks ago the uh, nature of the how we would go about doing this work. We would need to, as we did about 10 years ago when we completed a similar report on pipeline uh, valuation, uh, we will need to hire an outside consultant. This is a very uh, specialized area of valuation. We do have experts at the department, but to conduct this uh, multi-state uh, review and provide the information to the legislature, we will need a approximately $120,000 in additional funds to be able to complete that report. 
We are concerned that the bill fails to make the changes requested for the Board of Assessors. Current law requires the board's fees to cover its cost to operate, uh, not the general fund, and the proposal in the governor's budget uh, reduced the general fund expenditures and transferred that, uh, those fees to the board to meet that obligation under the statute. We think that uh, it, this is time to align the, bo the bill and the governing statute uh, in, in this legislation. We have significant concerns with the structure of appropriations in this bill. Um, in addition to the appropriation riders and other bill requirements, which will constrain our ability to manage across the agency for upcoming uh, needs. For over 20 years, the department has received appropriations for each of its two programs, tax administration and debt collection. The structure has worked well for that period of time and there's no reason to make this change now. The more detailed appropriation structure combined with the rider language will tie our hands and actually reduce our ability to respond in real time to quickly changing needs. As circumstances change, such as cybersecurity threats that continue to grow, the department will lose its flexibility to quickly refocus resources. Um, Madam Chair and Chair Kiffmeyer and Chair Anderson, I also want to note the lack of funding for statewide cybersecurity and technology systems such as SWIFT. The failure to fund Minute, particularly to request on cybersecurity, will put at risk information that is stored at the Department of Revenue. We have about 120 Minute employees who work alongside revenue employees each day, and personnel cuts to Minute will be translated into reduced use of technology by agencies or additional costs to agencies through rates. We cannot overstate the importance of ensuring that the data that we uh, store across the state is secure. For us, that means tax data of millions of Minnesotans and the financial information of over 400,000 businesses. This bill puts that security at risk. Um, Madam Chair, I would like to take a moment to correct the record with respect to the departments and its uh, relationship to IT consolidation. Um, the department has consolidated virtually all services with the minute. Uh, we have consolidated employees, payroll, uh, our service desk, um, IT contracts. Um, the one area that the list that I believe, uh, Chair Anderson, you were referring to was regards to our data center. Um, we are in active negotiations with minute to uh, move to a consolidated data center. At this point, our data center is run by minute. Uh, it is not run by the department, it's run by minute, uh, and it is secure. Um, we are subject to federal regulations when it comes to federal tax information that we receive from the IRS. Um, it's important that the department would be able to receive that information, and uh, I know minute and our, our minute at revenue folks are working closely with the IRS to make sure that the uh, cloud uh, or the other data center areas uh, meet the requirements of the IRS. And as soon as uh, we can work that out with the federal government, then and we will be moving forward in that space. But we are working actively on it, and we have consolidated virtually every other service that I am aware of that Minute has been able to consolidate so far. So I want you to know that we um, are actively participating in that. We appreciate so much the work that we do. Um, our chief business technology officer is a Minute employee, of course, but he sits on my senior management team because he's, Minute is an integral part of uh, how we manage all of the services we provide to our employees and leverage technology for our customers. So thank you, uh, chairs, for the time, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Commissioner Bowerly. Members, Chair Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, Commissioner Bowerly, I appreciate you coming here to provide your testimony. You know, I think one of my biggest concerns, you've probably heard this uh, as well, is that uh, the department, as, as part of your request to the governor, is asking for over a $20 million increase to your budget to basically continue doing the same thing that you are doing currently. So I have real concerns about that and what that means for the taxpayers of Minnesota. Uh, your uh, increased request for the governor's uh, budget proposal is over 11% increase. Uh, I think the uh, citizens of Minnesota um, aren't expecting that our state agencies are going to be asking for, in your case, 11 percent, in the case of the commissioner of MMB, 78 percent. These are significant increases that you're looking for in growing state government. So I just have some concerns with that and look forward to working with you as we uh, work towards the negotiations of the uh, budget. So thank you for your time. Uh, commissioner Bowerly. Madam Chair, and, and thank you, Chair Anderson. I think um, 
what I hear from Minnesotans is that they want more from the Department of Revenue. They would like their refunds faster. They would like more by way of uh, classes offered to small businesses as they start their businesses. I would note at Small Business Week, and we just enrolled on our website a sort of a business center so that we've consolidated all the information to make it easier on those small businesses who may not have um, lots of outside advisors helping them. Uh, and so I think um, Minnesotans would be disappointed if we were unable to deliver the level of services that we have now, and they're asking for more. And the reality is that um, our organization, like uh, every organization, face increasing costs, whether that be health care, um, you know, performance-based uh, salary changes, uh, lease costs, our legal costs, those costs go up. And because our agency is so, uh, our budget is so heavily dedicated to staff, that when we absorb those costs, um, we wind up reducing staff. Uh, and so that's the nature of our budget when it is so uh, it is based so heavily on our staffing. Thank you, Commissioner Rowley. Uh, one question: uh, In your request to the governor, how many additional employees would you add to the Department of Revenue if you had gotten the governor's uh, dollar amount request? Um, Madam Chair, I'm looking to see if Mr. Church can help me with that number. I can provide that for you. I believe it was about 20 employees. Thank you. All right. Members, any other questions? All right, thank you for your testimony. Mr. Kadelka? And Mr. Kadelka, about two minutes, please. Chair and committee members, for the record, my name is Kirk Kadelka. I'm Assistant Commissioner with the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. And I'm here today to to testify on Article 4, dealing with issues in Chapter 4, rulemaking, contested case hearings, et cetera. On April 13th, the all agency leadership sent a letter to the chairs of the committee that go into great detail on a number of these provisions, including examples of consequences of the pieces that are, are in the bill. So I will um, stick to a, a couple high-level themes regarding Chapter 4, and then two specific items about environmental policy that are in this bill and, and have not been heard elsewhere in the environment area. Overall, the themes concerning Chapter 4 changes are cost, trump, all other concerns, whether they're consumer protections, data privacy, food safety, worker safety. And we see this in a number of areas. We see this in the thresholds for rulemaking changes, where they don't account for other financial benefits that may be as a result of it, or other things that are harder to monetize, uh, public health, or other or fish and wildlife populations are not counted against those uh, caps. On the other side of regulation, we see it on the affirmative defense provision in contested case, where it says a regulated party that may have a regulation that has a $50,000 or more expense does not have to worry about any type of enforcement against them. They can just carry on. And this is a concern to us when we're looking at pieces of equipment that may be at a food processing facility, where Department of Ag and Department of Health may have regulations, or with other types of um, Healthcare systems, environmental agency work uh, dealing with refineries and other type of facilities. The second issue is it also adds the duplicative and redundant processes and increased costs unnecessarily. We hear from local units of governments, businesses, nonprofit organizations, and citizens that they would like the agency to make decisions quicker and provide clarity. The additional provisions in Article 4 make that even harder for the agencies to do as we have tried to meet those demands from the public. Specific to environmental pieces, there is a one small provision um, in the bill on page 107 of Article, 5, as Article 4, Section 5, dealing with the Metropolitan Solid Waste Plan. This is a, a plan that has helped bring collaborative change and positive results in the metropolitan area in the areas of recycling, composting, and how we handle our solid waste. Some of these examples include prioritization of organics, better data, coordination of services, such as metro you know, um, consistent hauling licenses and hazardous waste regulations. The plan also creates a framework that fosters consistency and predictability for the solid waste industry. However, a slight few words within the guidance provision dealing in Article 4 throws this on its head and exempts 
what is allowed for in Chapter 473 from occurring, and in process removes the authority for the Metropolitan Solid Waste Plan, which the local units of government and counties are in the process of fulfilling their local plans, which I know the Solid Waste Management Coordinating Board that represents the metropolitan area have also submitted a letter in opposition to this. Our concerns is we haven't had testimony on what are the problems that this piece is trying to solve. We've gone through an extensive public process in the, creating the Metropol Metropolitan Solid Waste Policy Plan, where we have had uh, comments and responded to them and put out a, a final document and have not heard um, concerns since that time. Uh, Mr. Kodalka, we just need to, if you could conclude, please. Madam Chair and, and committee members, the last piece is dealing with environmental review. There's a duplicative report in here that requires agencies and local units of government to look at mandatory categories for EAWs, environmental assessment worksheets, EISs, environmental impact statements, that is already required under other law every five years. The question is, um, when we're in the midst, EQB is in the midst of looking at mandatory categories already and has started an advisory group through the rulemaking process, why are we requiring a room a report every two years when rulemaking takes longer than that to even address what was in the last report? Um, thank you, Mr. Cadell. Members, thank you. Thank you. Members, questions? I think, Mr. Kodalka, thank you, but one comment I would like to make. When you pass rules, when rules are passed, there is a financial effect, financial effect to the business, a financial effect to the residential owner <clears throat> that has expenses put upon them, and they have to take out of their checkbook to pay for it. That means they don't have the money in their checkbook that they might need to use uh, to do upgrades on their home in some other way. And so, yes, there are financial issues, but I think it's important to realize that our taxpayers out there, business, residential, personal, are affected by these as well. And they are finite in how much they can afford uh, for well-intentioned but still very burdensome rules. So I just want to make that comment. Thank you, Mr. Kodelka. Commissioner Lindsay. Welcome, Commissioner. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Kevin Lindsay. For the record, my, the spelling of my last name is L-I-N-D-S-E-Y. I'm the Commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Human Rights. I appreciate the opportunity to address you today, Madam Chair and members of the committee. The governor's budget really is about setting a course for all in the state of Minnesota. It's been my pleasure as it relates to serving as commissioner over the last five years. And what I can tell you is that the work of the Department of Human Rights is very much appreciated and needed by everyone within the state of Minnesota. It may not feel like it, but I would urge you to really think about the governor's budget to say that we are in the midst of dramatic change and it's necessary for us to ensure that we include a spot at the table for everyone. And that's whether they want to work, whether they want to start a business, just to be fully engaged in the life in the state of Minnesota. And the Department of Human Rights really facilitates that. It's not just simply for one class of individuals. When I go around the state and I say that the most common type of discrimination complaint filed with the department concerns individuals with disabilities, many people are surprised. But then again, I followed up by saying 11% of the individuals currently living in the state of Minnesota identify as a person with disabilities. And then I remind them that in a very short period of time, one in five Minnesotans will be over the age of 65. And half of the individuals currently over the age of 65 identify as a person with disability. Again, we're really trying to create a space at the table for everyone within the state of Minnesota. And that's why it's critically important that you fully take into consideration what the governor is asking as it relates to supporting regional offices and adequate funding for the Department of Human Rights. In less than 10 years, we will go from about 64% of the individuals between the ages of 15 and 64 of being working age adults to the high 50s. 
What that means is that every employer today really needs to think strategically about how they create pathways to all communities to ensure they have a vibrant workforce. To that extent, I've had a chance to, and I think uh, as Commissioner Bowerly did, the, the tireless effort of the staff to be able to distribute a letter that I had submitted earlier to Senator Kiffmeyer and Representative Anderson, but more importantly, a letter from the mayors of St. Cloud, Worthington, Duluth, and Rochester. And particularly within the letter, they said they are committed to working, or we are committed to working collaboratively with business, nonprofit, and community le leaders on the issues that face our cities and regions, our regions. We appreciate the civic engagement work of the department to strengthen relationship between citizens and government and to work with local government officials and people in Minnesota on issues such as ending homelessness, integrating people with disabilities, and ending school bullying. We believe that the presence of the human rights regional offices will help our cities and regions enhance the collaborative work that has been undertaken to find local, local solutions to the issues before us and help us achieve shared success. Economic development and ensuring opportunities for all in our cities and regions are needed to ensure a vibrant future for Minnesota. We have had good conversations with the commissioner about the proactive efforts of the department to spur economic development and create opportunities for all. We all look forward to working with officials from the Department of Human Rights to create opportunities for all emerging, all emerging entrepreneurs and small businesses in Minnesota. Again, I appreciate the, the opportunity to address you, Madam Chair and members of the committee, and I stand available for any questions that you may have concerning the governor's proposal for the department. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Commissioner. Members, any questions? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony, Commissioner. Appreciate it very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, next on the agenda is Mr. Nooker. And our final testifier will be Ms. Fast. Is uh, Mr. Nooker here? Um, maybe, maybe we should just go on to Ms. Fast. If Mr. Nooker does come, we'll um, take him as the testifier. He's here. He is here? All right, wonderful. Welcome, Mr. Nooker. And if you could just... Um, are you going to help out there, Ms. Fraser? Yes, yes, All right. I can help. Okay, so of course, um, we'll need you to state your name and who you represent for the audio record. All right, so I'm Eric Nooker and I work for the Minnesota Department of Agriculture, but I'm here representing myself. And um, I also would like you to know that I'm deaf. First off, I wanna thank you guys for maintaining the state agency accommodations reimbursement fund. And secondly, I want to urge you to modify the policy requiring agencies to provide a 50% match. I feel that this is gonna make it harder for people with disabilities to initially get hired. And hiring managers may and likely do think about the cost of accommodating um, disabilities, and it may not be um, consciously, but it happens subconsciously, I feel. And I felt this played a factor in my own recent job search. I have a master's degree and I applied for over 100 jobs. And so it, it took a, a long time to get to the new position that I have now, which is I was hired a month ago as a soil scientist. So I know the accommodations fund was important to my manager when he hired me. The accommodations fund gave me a fair chance to get hired and also prove myself um, with a video phone, with sign language interpreter relay and sign language interpreters. I now am able to perform the duties of my job that fits my skills and my abilities and it's a job that I really enjoy doing. So in a review not too long ago, both my manager and myself touched base and we felt that it was working out pretty well for both of us. And so other people with disabilities just need to be given that same chance. The 50% match may get in the way with that. So I was thinking maybe 
something you could think about is implementing the 50% match for long-term employees who already work for the state and have already proven themselves. And that would also give hiring managers the time to budget for those accommodations. I just feel this would be a better um, solution for newly hired people with disabilities. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nooker. Thank you very much for your testimony. Members, any questions? Chair Anderson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Mr. Nucker, for coming today to testify. We uh, went to the 50% match so that we could help more people. And to stretch the dollars. That's good to know. I can see where you're coming from with that. So, Thank you. Thank you, Chair Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Nooker. Appreciate it very much. You're taking the time to come today. Okay. Ms. Fast. Welcome, Ms. Fast. Please state your name and who you represent for the audio record. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'm uh, Gina Fast, the Executive Director for the Board of Cosmetology. The nearly 50% uh, proposed reduction uh, to the board would have rippling effects uh, to the public. The board is hitting a stride in performing the services, the licensees, and the public demand of us. Our licensees and the public are energized and engaged about the board, and they see us making a difference in their lives. The board regulates over 40,000 licensees, and it's statutorily created to protect the health and safety of the people and to promote public protection and infection control. The proposed cut on the people of the state is real and puts public protection at risk. The first area of impact would be field inspections. We project that this proposed reduction would result in salons being inspected at best once every three to four years, instead of just over annually um, or shifting inspections to only when a complaint is filed. This means a dramatic reduction in field education that has a direct proven result in proving public protection. The reduction will also no longer allow Minnesota to be a leader in promoting and educating on infection control. Education with our licensees requires our field staff to be at the salon doing inspections. We easily could become one of the worst ranked states on how often field inspections occur, creating a greater public risk and a more of a wild west out in salons. Next, the board would be forced to reduce the amount of complaints it could investigate. The end result of executed complaints generally has remedial education requirements to get licensees back up to minimum competency. This is not your run of the mill, I got a bad haircut or I don't like my nail polish. This is where we hear about the person going to the nail salon where they're unlicensed to do an eyebrow wax and an eyebrow tint. This unlicensed person completes a wax, opening the pores of the skin, uh, followed with a chemical application was, which results in burning and scarring. This is where we hear about a color, a colorist not patch testing per manufacturer's directions on a new client and they end up with a chemical burn and loss of hair. This is where the young mother goes in for a bikini wax and the salon does not properly disinfect the service area. They also double dip the wax sticks being used on customer after customer uh, with the end result to this young mother, a staph infection that nearly cost her her life. This is where the school right here in Minnesota is allowing students to come and go as they please, not educating them, but giving them credit, resulting in fraudulent training of Minnesota. My investigators would not be able to investigate things like that. Finally, this is where we find out where a licensed stylist has lapsed their professional liability insurance and the results uh, for the public is no financial recourse if they've injured a client. The proposed cut would also result in the board violating Minnesota statute uh, that requires all licensees to be processed within 15 business, day, business days. This was a legislative mandate put on the board. Put onto the board, delay in license, licensure frustrates everyone. What does it mean for the state? It means it will take longer to get new graduates working, not allowing them to make an income, possibly defaulting on student loans and other financial obligations. The proposed cut will delay people's ability to work in the professions and open a new business. We would also have a diminished capacity to verify credentials, uh, in particular for foreign uh, candidates, ensuring all applications for licensure meet requirements. 
I'm not sure if the conference committee is aware that cosmetology has an extremely high national fraudulent submission rate on credentials. Most professions uh, on application have a fraud rate of about 1%. We've seen uh, nationwide and here in Minnesota, the fraud submissions for cosmetology applications soar over 50% for the applicants that go through this process. This means that if we don't have the resources to verify the credentials, hundreds of applicants a year that are unqualified and untrained may get a license. The proposed cut would be in fact uh, greater as the cost like unemployment as the board would need to lay off more than 50% of its staff. We'd have increased technology, fees, insurance, benefits, cost of living, step increases that would all need to be absorbed by the board. The level of funding will leave us paralyzed in the services we offer. And, can, and our contribution to a safe Minnesota will be significantly lessened. We do appreciate the inclusion of the policy language of the eyelash extensions. However, we, we will struggle with how staff would write the rules and develop the license in our database um, with the significant reduction in funding. And finally, the uh, board's main revenue is license fees and the proposed cut would mean that virtually 50% of all funds paid by cosmetology licensees would remain in the state's general fund to fund other projects in this bill and not the board uh, that they hold a license. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fast. Thank you, Ms. Fast. Members, any questions? Uh, Representative Nash. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Ms. Fast, I know that we just met yesterday and you're gonna provide me some information, but can you detail the, the information that we talked about around the money that was appropriated for expenses for last year and what it went to now? Because that's, I, I know, at least in the House side, it was a topic of frequent conversation um, and specifically about what it went to um, that you're, you're currently inhabiting. Ms. Fast. Uh, Madam Chair and members of the committee, well, currently the funding is going to staffing, like as of today. Representative Nash. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and Ms. Fast, you had talked about uh, in 2015, 2016, that the money that was appropriated uh, was not spent on exactly what it was appropriated for. Uh, that's really where I was headed. So if we can, if we can, you know, I, I don't want to seem antagonistic, but that's, the, you know, deflecting the answer is gonna just prolong this. So if you could tell us what the money that was appropriated actually was spent for, that'd be great. Ms. Fast. Madam Chair and Representative Natch, I wasn't trying to be disrespectful. I was really trying to answer the question because the committee has had asked questions of what our current FTE load is. So, um, yes, so in 2015, um, when the board brought, uh, brought, brought forward an increase in license fees that was supported by the professional association, um, that bill was um, introduced in the House and didn't uh, get any traction, but was uh, brought through the Senate. So the House didn't um, hear any testimony or have any engagement in, in, that, um, in the discussion. So when we were negotiating the increase in um, the license fees and the costs that would go with it, which would be included um, additional space. Um, the Senate uh, had uh, requested that the infrastructure costs to support the vision of the legislation of the additional staffing, because we would need more physical space for the staff and the rent that was in it, which is in the fiscal note, that that would all be absorbed uh, by the board in the realistically in the initial phases of the fiscal year 16 funding, because as of day one on July 1st of 2016, the position descriptions for the additional staff, MMB's approval, posting, and hiring would not have been able to actually happen as of exactly July 1. So the Senate had asked us uh, to absorb the cost of the infrastructure, as well as another item they had asked us to absorb in the increased fees was the $45,000 uh, legislation for the Senator Rest Mobile Salon Bill. So those were the components that the Senate had asked us to do. Thank you, Ms. Fast. Representative Nash. Well, Madam Chair, and you know, we'll, we'll can, we can get into the weeds on this later. Uh, but the money that was appropriated was for people and it's gone to do office space and other things. And, you know, in yesterday's conversation, and uh, you know, I'm not holding you accountable for that now. We're going to get into that hopefully when you provide me the details. But, you know, there's, there's common area maintenance things that we didn't get cleared up and there's a long list of things that you were going to provide for me. Um, you know, I, I just think that it's, it's uh, a little bit troubling that money that was appropriated for personnel 
was put towards physical infrastructure. Uh, and you and I talked about that, and you said, you know, I, I, I think I've, I've learned some things from this experience. And, uh, you know, I think that at the very least, we're looking for answers. And I hope that you will be able to provide that. And you know, I, I didn't hear it in your testimony, and that's why I brought it up, because I, I did want it to, to be brought out that uh, you're aware of that, but that you're working to provide us some details. Thank you, Representative Nash. Uh, Ms. Fast? Uh, Madam that. Chair and uh, members of the committee, Representative Nash, we um, were working la late last night and this morning on the numbers, and you had asked them by Wednesday or Thursday, and that's our expectation is to deliver those to you electronically and in paper as you asked. So, yep. Thank you, Ms. Fast. Ms. Fast, one question, though. Uh, one of the most frequent comments that I will hear, uh, have heard in regards to this area is the fact that, yes, those entities do want the inspections. Uh, they feel they have paid for them, but they also feel that in many cases they are not getting them. And so they're, they're paying, but they do not. And many of those inspections, the purposes for them was to prevent, not to catch or prosecute, uh, but to prevent. So I look forward to our working together for that purpose, for those uh, that I know you care about as well. Thank you, Ms. Fast. Thank you. Members, anything more? Okay, we've concluded our items on the agenda for testifying, and with that, um, we're going to go ahead and proceed on adopting the amendment. Chair Anderson? Thank you, Madam Chair. I move the adoption of the A-17. Madam Chair? Senator Lane? Um, I have a couple of amendments that I would like to put forth before we move for adoption. Uh, no, Senator Lane, we are... All right. Pass All right. them out. Madam Chair, I have um, the Amendment 78. It's uh, simply adding policy language for uh, the Department of Administration, some clarification for them. Uh, so Amendment 78, please. And I would uh, move that adoption. Madam Chair. Uh, Sen Representative O'Driscoll. Um, None of the members have the amendments that Senator Lane is referring to. We will wait to, until. So I, but I would just ask the indulgence of the chair that we not move until members have had a chance to review those amendments. Absolutely. Okay, Senator Lane, before you proceed, uh, council has advised us that um, we must first adopt the official 414 amendment, and then we can consider your amendment. Thank you. So if you would mind temporary withdrawing. All right, Madam Chair, I will withdraw it now. All right, with that, Chair Anderson. Uh, Madam Chair, I move the adoption of the A17-0414 amendment. We have that motion. Any discussion? Seeing none, we'll proceed to a vote. All those in favor? of the 0414 A17 amendment, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. Senator Lane. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I wonder if, we, if I could call um, Matt Scherer over to, to uh, talk about this policy language. Uh, Senator Lane, you have to first move your okay. amendment. Thank now. you. I, I move uh, the amendment A78. Motion has been moved. Members, do you all have the... Amendment A78, okay. All right, uh, and you are requesting uh, Request. testimony, and uh, so we have a testifier, Mr. Scherer. Um, yes, Madam Chair, committee members, for the record, my name is Matt Scherer. I'm the Legislative Director for the Department of Administration. The A78 amendment in front of you uh, is the language that was approved by the governor, um, both for policy language and in the supplemental budget. Uh, a portion of this language uh, was uh, included in the bill. Senator Kiffmeyer included some language related to assistive technology uh, from Senator Carlson's original proposal, and uh, this proposal did also meet the first deadline in the House. Just to do a quick walkthrough of the amendment, uh, lines 1.3 through 1.8, is some language that would allow admin to collect fees for room usages in the state capitol. This is part of the governor's supplemental budget. And the language covers costs associated with event work that would go beyond the typical staffing level. So think uh, events that might happen on nights and weekends that we could cover those costs. Lines 1.9 through 2.11 uh, streamline uh, the state's professional and technical contracts. 
Currently, um, the AG's office essentially, um, after admin goes and reviews to make sure that they meet state statutory requirements, the AG signs off without additional review. And this kind of catches up statute with the practice today. Uh, lines 2.12 to 2.14 codifies the Office of Equity and Procurement. For those of you who sit on the State Government Finance Committee, you might recall that we funded this in 2015. The office was set up with that appropriation. We wanted to uh, clarify the duties of the office. Um, lines 2.25 through 2.42 was brought by some admin stakeholders. Um, this amendment allows targeted group businesses, people that are trying to become targeted group business programs. If you're a member of an association, so think uh, like a women's, uh, women's chamber of commerce, um, that part of their, one of their requirements for joining that would be that the business is 51% owned by um, a woman, uh, we would take the membership in that organization to meet some of the requirements uh, of this program, simplifying it for businesses, making it easier for them to become certified in the program. And finally, the last uh, section uh, is 4.3 through 4.24, which relates to the Data Analytics Master Contract Program. This, as you might recall, was set up during the 2011-2012 biennium. Uh, and in consultation with state agencies, this has been a pretty underutilized program uh, at the moment, and this uh, section seeks to expand the types of services that we can offer in the master contract program to include continuous improvement, lean, and other tools for efficiencies that we think would match the theme of the program and would increase usage in that program as well. So with that, that's the conclusion of the description. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Chair. Members, any questions? Chair Anderson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Mr. Schur. I just have a, a question for you on this. Looking through this, this is all policy language. Is it then the governor's office's uh, position that we would have policy language in the finance bill? Mr. Chair. Madam Chair, committee members, I haven't spoken with the governor's office about this amendment. Madam Chair. Chair Anderson. Uh, Mr. Scheer, also the agencies have expressed concern about having policy language in the fiscal bills. Has the Department of Administration have a different view than any of the other agencies or the governor's office? Mr. Scheer. Chair, uh, uh, Representative Anderson, I haven't discussed this with other agencies. Thank you, Mr. Scheer. All right, members with that, we have the amendment in front of us, the A78. We'll proceed to a vote. All those in favor of the A78, please say aye. Opposed? No. Motion does not prevail. A78 is not adopted. Senator Lane. Madam Chair, I have one other small amendment. Uh, the A79. S okay, A79 will be passed out by staff. We will not proceed on it until we have the amendment in front of us as members. <laughs> All right, Senator Lane, to your amendment, the A79. Thank you, Madam and Chair. And first of all, Senator Lane, you just need to move it. Pardon? You just need to move your all amendment, right. and Madam then we Chair, can discuss I, I would it. like to move the amendment A79. All right, go ahead and to Senator Lane. Thank you. Uh, this is just simply uh, reinstating the Office of the Econo on the Economic Status of Women when the House language uh, listed the specific things that the, are under the LCC, they neglected to add this in, which was, in effect, uh, deleting them. And I would like to uh, uh, put that back in because I think it's an important component. And I would like to have uh, Greg Hubinger from the LCC just make a few comments on this. Thank you, Senator Lane. Uh, members, any questions or comments? We do have a testifier. Is uh, okay. There he is. Mark. Yeah. yeah. Welcome to the committee, Mr. Hubinger. Um, Madam Chair and members, I'm Greg Hubinger with the Legislative Coordinating Commission. I have not seen the amendment, um, but I'm aware of Senator Lane's intent to clearly indicate that the dedicated staff in the LCC that support that office would be retained. Thank you, Mr. Hubinger. Chair Anderson. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, Senator Lane, in the bill, uh, as the language is written, we do not eliminate the office on the economic status of women. In fact, what we do is we make it stronger for legislative oversight and we empower the legislators to be the actively engaged in this issue. Uh, so with that, members, I'd recommend a no vote. Senator Lane. Um, Madam Chair, where would it be, uh, in the language, would it be uh, increased or empowered? It appears it's not listed as a entity that would be funded. It's just simply um, an advisory committee, which actually exists at this point um, and is, uh, has the House and Senate leadership from point advisory committee members, but that uh, it actually is enacted every, every time we, uh, every two years, um, I don't see where the Office of Economic Status of Women exists in the bill. Thank you, Senator Lane. Um, Chair Anderson. Um, Madam Chair and uh, Senator uh, Lane, uh, if you look on page two, uh, which is the same that your amendment uh, states, and you're looking at lines 13 through 17, uh, what we're doing is we're having the uh, Economic Status of Women Advisory Committee uh, be the same that we have for SER, the same that we have for the Minshire Oversight Committee, and a host of other oversight committees that we have. So we're putting it on the same level and making sure that we have greater legislative oversight on it and uh, so that we as legislators are more engaged in this issue than we have been. So, Thank you, Chair Anderson. Senator Lane. Madam Chair. Um, this advisory committee on, that you're speaking of, as I understand it, uh, doesn't exist in statute. It continues to be uh, renewed in, uh, every couple of years, and uh, we have um, appointed uh, members to it. But this, this is, exists, but the actual work is done via the Office of the Economic Status of Women, uh, on Women. And without that, we would not have um, any of the work that we have now um, supervising or, or having oversight or giving us information about this. This uh, advisory committee does not do that work. This advisory committee simply um, um, looks at that work, but who's going to do it? And this is, a, this is an actual thing that I would not like to see eliminated in our, in our work to be attending to the economic status of women. This is something that the public is demanding. This is something that we need, I think we all um, uh, are interested in. Uh, it's of great concern to our public and our constituencies. Uh, I, I do not want to have this simply um, uh, seen as that the advisory committee, which just simply uh, oversees the work, is going to be able to take on that work. There's no funding for it. There's no uh, obligation for it. It's, it's not the same at all. And Madam Chair, I would like a roll call on this. Thank you, Senator Lane. A roll call being requested. A roll call is granted. Chair Anderson. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and Senator Lane. We actually make it stronger because we are putting it in session law. So we have a stronger position on this than what has been done previously. And based upon your arguments, then we should have all of the uh, uh, advisory committees uh, under the weaker position that you're proposing to do. So members, if you don't want to weaken this situation, you're going to vote no on this amendment. Thank you, and Chair Anderson. Senator Chair. Lane. Uh, I, I don't uh, find logic in that argument, actually. Um, it... Uh, the, putting this particular advisory committee into statute so that it doesn't have to be renewed every two years does not change the fact that it doesn't have any money and doesn't do the job. The office does the job, and eliminating that will eliminate the work that we have on the Office of the Economic Status of Women. Uh, be very alert that this is something that the constituencies are attending to and do want. Thank you, Senator Lane. Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, if I might, I would like to ask um, Senator Lane a couple of questions, if I could. Sure, Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Madam uh, Chair. Let me just ask, Senator Lane, do you yield to answer a question? All um, right, Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Huber, when he testifies that he had not seen the amendment, Senator Lane, has Amendment 789 that we're taking up right now been posted for the public to see it, or did you just bring that to the committee today? Senator Lane. Um, Madam Chair, this is how it is done in the Senate, where, where bills are, uh, amendments are brought at the time. I actually drafted this um, 
back earlier and had it with the council. Um, um, Mr. Hubinger is aware of it. He hasn't physically eyed it, which is very simple, as simply as you can see. But he is aware of it and asked to be the one who would state, make a statement about it. So, yes. Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Lane. Representative O'Driscoll. So simply the answer was no. I'm, I'm not arguing rules. I'm just asking right. for transparency because at this time of the process, many will raise the issue of transparency. So I did, did believe I heard for, uh, Senator Lane say that 78 and possibly 79 were not available for public inspection. Thank you, Representative O'Driscoll. All right, members, a roll call being requested. The clerk will take the roll. Chair Anderson. No. Representative Nash. No. Representative Detmer. No. Representative O'Driscoll. No. Representative Fenton. No. Senators. We just need to get a little. Senator Kiffmeyer? No. Senator Anderson? No. Senator uh, Hall? Senator Coran? No. Senator Lane? Yes. There being nine no's, one aye, uh, the motion for A79 is not adopted and does not pass. Thank you, members. Uh, with that, I believe we have the action of the uh, committee in front of us. We have adopted the um, 0414 amendment. Uh, to the uh, bill here at this time. And so members with that, our um, business being completed today, I do want to um, say, I'll, I'll recognize Chair Anderson here shortly, do want to say very much my gratitude and thanks for our Senate staff, Ms. James, Mr. Lundeen, Ms. Uh, as well, all of our staff, uh, to Mr. Carlson, et cetera. So we really appreciate that very much, Chair Anderson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and I would like to echo your comments as well. Uh, Ms. James, uh, Mr. Lundeen, um, Mr. Gehring, uh, Ms. Roberts, Mr. Holquist, uh, Mr. Cook, um, um, <laughs> Mr. Carlson. I, know. I knew it was Anderson Carlson or Johnson. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> And all, to all the members, the conferees, and the people in the public that are, have been particip participating in this process. So thank you very much. Thank you, Chair Anderson. And with that, members are Senator Lane. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, what is the uh, uh, pro process now? I mean, are we closing up the conference committee? Have we passed this uh, bill in general? What is, what is the process? Senator Lane, we, uh, we only close and complete our work in the conference committee when we do the conference committee report. This is an amendment to the bill. Senator Hall. All right. With that, members, and our business being included for today, but to, to just affirm that a conference committee is still in process, uh, but we are adjourned for today. Thank you. <laughs>